yeah, I think you can start. All right. Okay. So, uh, so welcome. Uh, we are. We have a session on program verification and symbolic analysis. Uh, I'm Saurav Vansal. I'm a faculty member at Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Uh, we have uh, five exciting papers lined up in the session. Uh, so let's get started. The first paper is Local Reasoning About Presence of Bugs, Incorrectness Separation Logic by Azalea Rad from Imperial College of London and Max Planck Institute of, for Software Systems. So yeah, let's get, uh, so Chunka, could you please play the video? Hello everyone, thank you for joining me virtually today. I'm Azalea and I'm going to talk to you about our recent work on incorrectness separation logic, which is joint work with uh, Josh Bedin, Hai Dang, Derek Dreyer, Peter Han, and Jules Villar. Let's start with a quick overview of the state of the art. When it comes to verification, there are typically two schools of thought. There are correctness techniques when we try to prove the absence of bugs for a given program. These techniques are usually based on over approximate behaviors of a program. Because if you manage to show that larger set, that superset doesn't uh, um, include any bugs, then by definition, the smaller set of possible behaviors of the program is not going to have any bugs either. Thanks to advances in local reasoning, such as separation logic, we have managed to make these techniques compositional, both in code, uh, which means that we can actually apply them to uh, incomplete small fragments of code, as well as in the resources that they access. In other words, you can have spatial locality. And thanks to this compositionality, these techniques now scale to larger development teams and larger code bases. On the other hand, we have bug catching techniques where we try to prove the presence of bugs. And by contrast, these techniques use under approximate reasoning. So they focus on a smaller sub subset of a, a program behaviors and try and find bugs in that smaller subset. Because if that smaller subset has a bug, then again, by definition, the larger set of uh, possible behaviors of the program, which includes the smaller subset, is also going to have those bugs. And again, by contrast to the correctness worlds, uh, world, these techniques are usually uh, instances of global reasoning without any locality. There are obvious exceptions, such as a Facebook infer tool, where they use local reasoning techniques for better compositionality and scalability. But then again, if you look at the foundations of infer and how it was originally meant to be used, it's an instance of correctness technique, correctness-based analysis technique, um, even though it is currently deployed as a bug catcher at Facebook. So to understand this dichotomy better and to understand the foundations of bug catching, Peter O'Han recently started uh, to come up with a formalism with a rigorous foundation for bug catching, which gave rise to his recent work in Popol 20 on incorrectness logic. So what is incorrectness logic? So let's start with a notion that is hopefully familiar to most of you, and that is whole triples, which comes from the correctness world. When I write a triple, uh, PCQ, uh, what it means that for any state S and P, if I write program C on top of it and terminates, then it will result in some state S prime that satisfies Q or is in Q. In other words, uh, Q is a super, uh, super set of all the possible behaviors of C on P. Now, let's take that definition and flip the direction of subset inclusion the other way around. And since we have flipped it, let's also use a different notation. So I'm going to use square brackets and use a different color. And this is indeed the essence of incorrectness logic and incorrectness triples. So what this now means is that a Q is included in the set of possible states of a C on P. And every, so every state S in Q is reachable by running C on top of some state S prime on P. Now, aside from academic curiosity and research interest, there was a practical reason why Peter started looking at these triples. Uh, so to see that, let's go back to our whole triples. Again, um, since Q is a superset of the possible behaviors of uh, C, we know that Q is over approximating its possible behaviors. Diagrammatically speaking, we have a situation like this where Q is a bigger oval that includes the post conditions of C. Now, this is good if you're in the verification world, because if we can show that Q doesn't have any bugs, then by definition, the post conditions are not going to have any bugs either. Now, if we manage to find some bugs, and if they happen to be inside the post condition, then those are true bugs, and those are true positives. But it's also pos uh, possible for us to identify something that is still within Q, but it's outside the post. So we may uh, be, um, we, this is essentially a false positive where we identify something as a bug, even though it's never possible, it's never a possible post state of C. 
Now, generally, in incorrectness logic, we have this picture. Uh, Q is included in the post uh, condition, so Q is under approximated in this set of possible post states. Again, diagrammatically, this time, Q is inside the set of uh, post states. It, it's a smaller oval. So here, if I find any bugs in Q, these are going to be true bugs. Whatever bug Q identifies, because Q is included in the post, those are going to be true positives. Now, this time it is possible for us to miss some of the bugs that are in the post but not in the Q, as in we can have false negatives. But if we are in the bug catching work, this is okay, because what we are interested in is eliminating uh, false positives. We want to make sure whatever bug we report is a true bug at the expense of missing some of the bugs. And before moving on, it's worth noting that there is an extra bit of notation going on, usually in incorrectness logic. Uh, we have these exit conditions here, epsilon, that says that, okay, denotes how the execution happened. It can either be okay for a regular, um, for a normal execution or error for erroneous one. For instance, if I assign uh, y to x uh, and um, initially y has value b, I can show that this state in which x, y uh, are equal and they both have value b is reachable by running x um, equals y. And analogously, if I have an error statement in my language, I can show that there is an erroneous execution in which I can uh, reach a state that satisfies P, provided that the initial state also satisfies P. And finally, before moving on, uh, I'd like to show you this alternative equivalent definition of incorrectness triples, which I usually find more intuitive because it's more explicit. So it says that any state S in the post state Q is reachable from some state S prime in the pre state P. And reachability means that S prime and S are in the semantics, in the denotational semantics of C under epsilon, written square bracket C. So that was incorrectness logic in a nutshell, and as I'm sure you will agree, uh, it, is, it, it is the very first time that someone's given a formal foundation to bug catching, and you can think of it as an underapproximate analog of whole logic. And that's all well and good, but there are some limitations. In particular, since it's an instance of global reasoning, very much like the original whole logic, it is not compositional. And secondly, it can't target or identify memory safety bugs, in a sense, for instance, a use after free bugs or null pointed dereference bugs. And this is where we came in. So we tried to borrow some of the uh, locality principles of separation logic and add them into incorrectness, separ uh, incorrectness logic. In other words, we took incorrectness logic of Peter and Han, we took the original separation logic and we combined them into incorrectness separation logic or ISL for short. That would give us a compositional uh, bug catching technique. And you can think of ISL as an under-approximate analog of the original separation logic. That, so as a result, we can use it to target memory safety box, such as use after free. And thanks to its compositionality, it is scalable. And in fact, it is inspired by an existing tool at uh, Facebook called Pulse. And as I will show you very briefly, uh, in the, it's not very straightforward to take incorrectness logic and add separation logic on top of it because in naive attempts, will immediately break the frame rule, um, which is at the core of separation logic, and we can't spare that. So in order to fix this, we had to change the original model of separation logic and into a monotonic model that I will explain in a minute what that means in order to recover uh, the frame rule. And as it turns out, this monotonic model has another nice property in that it allows us to recover the footprint property for those of you're familiar with the original separation logic, a property that did not hold of the original separation logic, and in fact was the culprit for not having completeness in the original separation logic. And finally, we built an analysis based on ISL, and by definition, again, because it's an instance of uh, under-approximate reasoning, we have this theorem that says whatever bug that I, the ISL-based analysis identify, uh, identifies is a true positive, it's a true bug, so we have no false positives. Given the limited amount of time left, I'm going to focus on ISL and its extension, why that's not straightforward, and you can find more details about all of this, uh, all the rest of it in the paper. So let's have a very, very quick introduction to what separation logic is for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, as you know, it's a local reasoning technique that is ideal when you reason about uh, heap locations, heap manipulating programs, especially in the presence of aliasing. So to see that, let's look at an example. So here I have a program where I ha uh, assign, uh, where I write three distinct values to three distinct memory locations, x, y, and z. Now, let's say I'm using standard whole logic, and I want to show that afterwards these three uh, locations have three distinct values. But I can only do that if originally I know that these three locations are indeed distinct, the three separate locations. Because otherwise, for instance, if X and Y were the same, they would both hold value to afterwards and not distinct values. Now, in the general case where I want to 
make n uh, distinct uh, writes to n distinct locations, uh, the number of conjuncts will immediately increase and I will have n factorial over two conjuncts, which is not, which is not uh, tractable. And this is where separation logic comes in and allows us to write assertions such as this, where I write x points to something to say that x is a heap location, and then I will use this conjunct, this star conjunct, to mean and separately. Essentially, I'm saying x, y, and z are distinct memory locations. Additionally, this points to assertion gives me the ownership of this heap location, so I know that I own it and I'm the only one who can access it, so no one else can do anything else with X. So this is a linear resource that can't be duplicated, so whenever I write X points to V, uh, star X points to anything else, any other value, including V, then I will get false. Now, the essence of separation logic lies at its uh, framing principle that says, okay, if you manage to prove some specification PCQ uh, for program C, then you can always extend that specification to larger contexts where you have more resources. And the way you can do it is by adding disjoint resources on both sides. Now, since you can always extend your specifications to larger contexts, when you write your specifications, you can focus on the smallest possible axiom that you can think of uh, in other words, local axioms, only focusing on the footprint of the operation, the exact resource it needs. For instance, when I'm writing V to memory location X, I need to own X beforehand. I don't care about its value, and afterwards it's going to have value V. Similarly, if I want to read from it, I'll need to own it beforehand, and afterwards Y will have the same value. I can always allocate more locations on the heap by using the alloc operation. I don't need any resource beforehand. Uh, this is uh, denoted by M, by the M possession, which is the empty heap. And afterwards, I will get a new location L on the heap and return it in X. And by the way, you can think of AMP as the uh, identity, uh, as the unit of the composition operator, because whenever you compose it with anything else, it will give you that thing back. It has no effect. And duly to allocation, you could always deallocate memory locations using the free operation, provided that you have the ownership of that location beforehand and afterwards you'll get the empty heap back. Right, so we've seen IL, now we've seen SL, now we and we want to combine it into incorrect separation logic. So we want on the approximate triples with this framing principle. So let's start with the naive attempt that I talked about, a very straightforward extension, essentially take those local axioms and reinterpret them in the under approximate setting. So this is my right axiom, if I own it beforehand, if I own X beforehand, don't care about the value, afterwards uh, X will point to B. And there is another interesting case for the error execu erroneous executions, especially in particular if I know that X is null to begin with and I try to write to it, then that will give me an error because that's essentially a null pointer dereference. So I can write an erroneous execution axiom that says you will get an error whenever you try to write to it and it is null. Uh, similarly for read, the OK case doesn't change and I will get a null pointer dereference case when X is null. Allocation remains uh, completely unchanged. And same for free, I will have the same axiom as before and add a null pointer dereference case. And at this point, we try, started doing the proofs and immediately realized that something is wrong. In particular, this last axiom breaks the frame rule. Let's see how. So let's remind ourselves, this is our frame rule that we want to preserve in ISL. This is the interpretation of triples, and this is the free axiom that we just saw. So now I'm going to use the frame rule on this axiom and uh, add resources on both sides. So I'm going to add X points to V on both sides, and um, using these um, axioms, the, these composition axioms, I'm going to rewrite this M star X points to V into X points to V, because M is idempotent. Uh, composition with M is on idempotent. So I will get X points to V on the right hand side and since X does, uh, points to something does not compose with itself, I will get false on the left hand side. Now what I obtained essentially says that a state in which X points to V can be obtained, can be reached by running a free X on some state that satisfies false. But no state satisfies false, so this triple is immediately incorrect. It turns out, in order to preserve the frame rule, what I need to make sure is that I need to ensure that any resource, any assertion that's compatible with the right-hand side of my triples is also compatible with the left-hand side. And this is exactly what happened here, because I had X points to V, which was compatible uh, with AMP, and it wasn't compatible with X points to V. That's why I got into um, pickle. So what is, the problem seems to be that the free uh, operation, the free axiom is lossy because after you have deallocated X, it forgets the information that X used to be a memory location. And that's how you get to, uh, into a problem by um, combining the X points to V. So to address this, we decided to change the model and 
introduce a, a model in which whenever you allocate locations, you still track them. In particular, instead of writing this axiom for free, what we're going to do is that we're going to change the post state and write this instead. So this says X is deallocated. And X is deallocated is very much an assertion like X points do. It still gives you ownership of that location. And instead of saying that it is an allocated location, it says it is deallocated. So in the same sense that we had these composition axioms for X points two, we're going to have analogous ones for uh, the deallocated um, assertion that it can't combine with itself. It's a linear resource. And it also doesn't combine with a points to assertion on X. So now if I go to my example from before, and this time try to compose X points to V on both sides, uh, I will get from what we just saw, false on the right-hand side and false on the left-hand side. And this time everything is okay because I'm saying any state that satisfies false is reachable by running free. So this triple is vacuously true because nothing satisfies false. So going back to our axioms, you just saw how I changed the axiom of free. The null pointer dereference case stays the same. And interestingly, I can write an extra axiom for the erroneous execution that says, if X is deallocated to begin with and you try to free it, then you get into an error. You can't deallocate something that has already been deallocated. Essentially, this is a use after free error. And similarly, for the right axioms, the OK and the no points of the reference case are the same. And additionally, I'll get this uh, views of the free case where X is deallocated and I try to write it, I get an error. And exactly the same for the read case. And allocation, the axiom that you saw from before remains unchanged. And now, interestingly, I can write another axiom that says, OK, whenever you try to allocate a location, if you have ownership of some deallocated location, it is possible for the allocated to pick that one and reallocate it. So you can reach a state in which Y is again allocated on the heap, provided that it was deallocated beforehand and you owned it. And that brings me to the end of the talk. I've shown you a brief glimpse of incorrectness logic and how we uh, extended it by combining it with separation logic to get a compositional bug catcher and how we had to fix the original model of separation logic to get this monotonicity property. There's more information in the paper about how this allows us to recover the footprint property and have completeness of our logic. And in terms of future work, we're hoping to extend uh, ISL with concurrency. Uh, and we are currently working on CISL, concurrent incorrectness separation logic and if this will allow us in the future to actually build tools for race detection, deadlock detection and so on. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, great. So thank you for that talk. Uh, we already have a question. Uh, there is work in model checking must abstraction example got it from all precisely with goal Can you hear me? I, my connection is very bad. Hi, Azalea. Can you hear my question? Uh, I, I think you're talking about the question on Slack. Hello? Hello? Yes, that's right. Okay, uh, so I, I think I'm Yeah, I'm talking about the question on Slack. That's right. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with my connection. I think I'm going to let Peter take this one. Um, you already uh, said that. Hi, one. yeah, this is Peter. Um, actually, I, we didn't look at the connection because we didn't know about it, but I only found out about this the other day. And in fact, there's a connection. They've got something, two transitions called must plus and must minus. The must minus transitions are very closely related to the under approximating triple. So yes, there is a connection. Okay, great. Thanks, Peter. Um, I don't, okay, there's another question. In your vision, which advanced extensions of separation logic, example cyclic proofs, fractional permissions, abstract predicates, might have natural and useful under approximating counterparts in application to local reasoning about bugs? Yeah, this is a question on Slack. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to read it. Um, so this is actually part of what we are exploring right now in uh, CISL. In so m many of these things that uh, Ilya has uh, mentioned, uh, like uh, fractional permissions or abstract predicates, they, they have been previously very useful when reasoning about over, in an over approximate way about concurrent programs. So right now, when uh, in our design of CISL, we are exploring all of this, uh, different models, what does it mean to uh, use these abstractions for bug catching? So what, without spoiling too much, uh, I can say stay tuned, but we think that, yes, some of these uh, 
concepts are quite useful for bug catching too. But uh, ultimately, our goal is to uh, have um, uh, like the whole point of uh, incorrectness logic in ISL was to have a rigorous foundation towards tools that are used for bug catching. So although a lot of these uh, more complicated ideas such as abstract predicates and later on uh, other concepts are very useful for sophisticated reason, they're not always very easy to extend into verification tools. So there is a delicate balance here of uh, using the right tools, using the right abstractions, but also keeping things simple enough uh, that we can actually have scalable verification tools, uh, bug catching tools built on them. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Azalea. I should mention the first question was by, from Shuvendu Lahiri, and the second question was from Ilya Sergey, who also said this was a very nice talk. Great. Thanks, Azalea. And let's move on to the next, uh, next paper. Uh, before I start with the next paper, I should say that there's a breakout session after this session. So please feel free to join that. The next paper is Reasoning Over Permission Regions in Concurrent Separation Logic by Akhenas Hober from National University of Singapore. Hi, I'm happy to be here at ECAV, also known as CAV Lockdown Edition. I'm going to present reasoning over permissions regions in concurrent separation logic. I'm Aquinas Hober, and this is joint work with James Brotherston, Diana Costa, and John Wickerson. I'm going to have a running example and pointer Z, X maps to Z, and separately, there is a tailless segment from Z to Y. I don't have data here, just next pointers to keep things simple. Now let's consider this traversal procedure foo. All it does is chase these next pointers until it reaches the guard value y. It doesn't modify memory at all. Suppose we want to run this code in parallel with itself, verifying the specification that if I start with a list segment from x to y, afterwards I have a list segment from x to y. This specification is true, but proving it in concurrent separation logic is not so easy. So concurrent separation logic introduced the following concurrency rule. If you want to verify a program that has two parallel threads, C1 and C2, it is enough to verify the threads independently, compositionally, as long as your two heaps are disjoint. In other words, as long as they share no memory locations. This is insufficient to verify our program because the list segment from X to Y doesn't separate from itself. So if I give it to A1, I can't give it to A2 and vice versa. All right, that drawback was understood early. A couple of years later, people realized that rather than strong separation, you could have a, a, a weaker version of separation that allowed overlap as long as some notion of fractional permissions were tracked. And basically, heaps store a data value and a permission at each location, like a rational number. And then these heaps can be composed even when they overlap, as long as at the overlap we can add the permissions. And in particular, the permissions have to sum to no more than one per location. Full permission, or one, means you can write, and less than full permission means you can only read. And at the logical level, you can think of this as this equation here, Reading from left to right, if I have half ownership of location X map, which has a D in it, weakly separated from half ownership of X maps to D, that is equivalent to full ownership of X maps to D. Or reading from right to left, if I have the right permission, I can split it into two read-only copies. That works for predicate, for individual points twos. But if you want to extend this idea to predicates, we use something called predicate multiplication. P raised to the pi means that the memory satisfies predicate P, but the permissions of memory locations have been pi fractionated or multiplied by pi. Let's see an example. List segment from x to y raised to the 1 half means that we have in memory a list segment from x to y changed together in the usual manner, except rather than owning each location 100%, each location is only owned 50%. This itself is a predicate. So if we want to raise it, for example, to the one half, well, that's the same as saying I have a list segment from X to Y where everything is owned 25%. Now, let's use that idea to build an intuitive idea for why this specification should be true. We have our list segment from X to Y. We split it into two read-only copies. We use the parallel rule to distribute one copy to each thread. We do our traversal. We then combine both back 
we have two read-only copies again, and then we combine those two read-only copies to restore full ownership of the listing. That's an intuitive idea, but in fact, it has several mistakes. In the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about what those errors are and how we're going to fix them. In brief, we have a fresh approach to verify concurrent programs that use simple data sharing paradigms for read-only resources. And we make two technical contributions. First, we have two kinds of separating conjunctions simultaneously. Weak separation, which we use when we want to represent sharing, and strong separation when we want to represent disjointness. Both of these forms of sharing have appeared before in the literature. What's novel about our approach is that we use both simultaneously. Second contribution, we borrow the notions of nominal labels and the jump modality from hybrid logic. And that's going to let us split and combine resources in a smooth manner. Let's begin. Why do we want two different kinds of separating conjunction? Well, I've already explained, if we just have the strong separating conjunction, then we're sort of dead immediately because we have no way to split list segment into two read-only copies. So if we're going to have one, it has to be the weak one. Now let's define linked list segments with the weak separating conjunction. And let's consider our traversal procedure, exactly the same as before. And what specification do we want to give? This one. If I have half ownership of a list segment from X to Y and I call foo, then afterwards I have half ownership of a, of a list segment from X to Y. Let's try to prove this. All right. First we want to do is check, is X equal to Y? If so, we're done immediately. Otherwise, we know x is not equal to y, and so we can unfold our list segment. Now we have a head and a tail. The whole half owned. We now want to distribute that half ownership inside. In other words, I own half of this head segment, weakly separated from half of the tail. Now I want to apply the frame rule apply the recursive rule, and then when I unframe back, I end up to where I was a few lines ago. And now I want to do the opposite of what I did before. Rather than distribute the one half in, I want to factor the one half out. That will get us to here. And then we can just fold up the recursive predicate and we're done. Except this step turns out to be unsound. Let's examine why this entailment fails. On the left, I'm going to put a formula, and on the right, I'm going to put a memory that satisfies that formula. So here's the formula x maps to z 1 half. And in memory, we have location x. It is owned 1 half, and its data value is z. Now, I'm going to consider the special case when y is equal to z. If we can't do the special case, we definitely can't do it for all y and z. One model for the list segment from z to z is the empty memory. Another model is any cyclic list segment that starts and ends with z. In particular, this cyclic list segment. Here I have z, it's 50% own, and its data value is x. I also own x 50%, and its data value is z. This memory will satisfy this predicate. When I add the memories, I end up with full ownership of this part of the list segment and half ownership of this part of the list segment. It does satisfy this formula on the left, but it does not satisfy the formula after we factor the one half out because we own full of this portion of it. The issue is not that we have list segments, or that we have the wrong definition of list segments, or that you, know, you should prevent cycles or something like that. The issue is that in general, A to the pi weakly separated from B to the pi does not entail A weakly separated from B the whole to the pi. The problem is that A and B may partially overlap. And that's exactly what we have here. We have half ownership in formula A, and we have half ownership of the same location in formula B, and so we end up with a strained result when we add them together. However, if we had a strong star rather than a weak star, things would be much different. If a strong star enforces disjointness, 
So if you have a strong star, then in fact you have both the distribution of pi into the con separating conjunction and the factorization of pi out of the separating conjunction. So that's what we proposed. Define list segments using strong star. Now the verification of foo is straightforward. And that's why we think you want both kinds of star. Sometimes you really want to talk about disjointness, and other times you really want to express sharing. Let's now return to our parallel program. Here was our proof sketch from before. We start with a list segment from x to y. We break it into two read-only copies. We then distribute one copy to each thread. We have now verified that foo will, in fact, give us this post condition after it's run. That's good. After both parallel threads finish, we then have two read-only copies. And then we put Humpty Dumpty back together again to restore right access. Except that putting Humpty Dumpty together again is also unsound. Let's take a look at why. And again, on the left, I'm going to have a formula. And on the right, I'm going to have a memory. And I'm going to consider the special case when x equals y. One model is just the empty memory for a list segment from x to x. Another model is any list segment that's cyclic that starts and ends at x. For example, this one. Now, these heaps do add together. They, end, they add together to have a cyclic list segment that starts and ends with x, but it's only half owned. So while it will satisfy this formula, it will not satisfy the formula where we have full ownership of a list segment from x to x. And again, the problem isn't that I've defined list segments in the wrong way or that there's a cycle and we should prevent the cycle. The problem is that generally speaking, a to the sigma, weakly separated from b to the sigma, may not entail a to the sigma plus pi. And the problem here, in some sense, is the dual of the problem we had before. Before, the issue was that things might overlap. Here, the issue is that things might not overlap. And that's exactly what we have here. The second formula, the second model for A, has two locations, x and z, which are not in the first model for A. So, going back to our proof, at the top, we knew that we had a list segment. Somehow, after we split it and did some parallel computation, we lost the fact that we had a list segment to begin with. In other words, intuitively, we know that these are actually the same list segment, but we've lost that information. And so what we're going to do is borrow an idea from a hybrid logic where we have variables alpha, beta, et cetera, which are interpreted as denoting unique heaps. And we can consider them as formulas, basically saying this heap is heap alpha. What does that mean? Well, if I have a specific concrete heap alpha, some sigma fraction, and the same concrete heap alpha, some pi fraction, because they are identical heaps, we have total overlap. That means we can conclude alpha with ownership sigma plus pi. Any other formula that we happen to have conjoined in just comes along for the ride. Let's use this idea to repair our proof. So we start with a list segment from x to y. We now know that we have to snapshot because we're going to split and then rejoin. So we make a fresh label alpha, and we snapshot. Alpha now describes the exact heap which is modeling or which this list segment is modeling. Now, we can then break this into two read-only copies. We distribute one copy to each thread. We do our traversal. We combine back. Now we have two read-only copies of the same heap. Therefore, we can add the permissions. Now we have one copy. We've restored read-write permission. And then we can just weaken away the alpha. So this parallel proof now works great. The only wrinkle is we've actually changed our specification for foo. Now we have this additional alpha. So we have to re-verify foo. Let's do that. All right, well, the case when x equals y, that's easy. We're done. 
Otherwise, x is not y, so we can unfold our recursive predicate, and then we can distribute the one-half inside. Now, we're in a little bit of trouble. Previously, what we did is we framed this so that we could then apply the recursive rule and then proceed. But now we can't frame because spatially we know the heap is actually alpha to the one half. We can't frame with a strong conjunction. If we weaken to get rid of the alpha, well, that's sound, but it's not going to let us prove our proof. It will let us, now we can apply frame and then apply the recursive rule, that all works great but we're never gonna be able to prove at the bottom of the proof that we've restored heap alpha. We've forgotten that information, it's gone. So, we need to record some additional information about labels and then use that information later. And we're gonna use the so-called jump modality of hybrid logic to do that. The pure formula at alpha P means that the formula P is true of the concrete specific heap given label alpha. This is a pure formula, so it has no spatial footprint. If you know at alpha p, and you know that the current heap is heap alpha, then you know that the current heap satisfies p. So by adding some additional labels and then using the jump modality to record how those labels fit together, we can complete this proof. Here's where we got stuck before. What we're going to do now is we're going to label beta and gamma, these two subparts of this separating conjunction. And then we're going to use the jump modality to record that alpha, here's alpha, is exactly the conjunction of beta and gamma. That's what we've got here. That part is pure. Spatially, we're here. And you'll notice that alpha is no longer true spatially. We've just weakened it away. It used to be here, but now we're storing information about alpha inside this pure jump modality. That means we can easily apply the frame, we can apply the recursive rule, we can unframe, and now we can use the fact that we know that alpha is exactly heap beta joined with heap gamma. We know we have heap beta, we know we have that joined with heap gamma, therefore we must have in total heap alpha. And after that, all we have to do is factor out the one half and then fold up the recursive predicate, and we're done. So, what's in the paper? We define an assertion language that has both strong and weak separating conjunctions. We add nominal labels and the jump modality from hybrid logic. We show how these uh, aspects work together, and we use this to verify programs with sharing. Thanks, and I look forward to your questions. All right, uh, so thank you. And uh, let's see, uh, we're still waiting for questions. Um, well, I have one. So I was wondering, um, you know, how amenable is your, is your technique, which involves uh, jump modality and, uh, and other things to automation of proof, proof automation, for example. I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I have, we, have, we have thoughts on that. Um, uh, in fact, we're, we're just experimenting with developing uh, a tool that can can do that, and we're trying to look at tractable fragments and and things like that. Um, looking at the examples that we have in the paper, um, the relatively simple examples where um, we have some confidence can be done. Um, there are some more complicated examples that involve sort of transferring of uh, resources from thread to thread, and then sort of uh, actually restoring write permission in a thread and making a change and then transferring that back. And it's, it's expressible, um, but we're less confident that we see a strategy right now to automate it. Okay, um, great, thank you. So, so, uh, so I move on to the next question in the interest of time. So there's a question from Dave Nauman. Uh, which parts of the problem disappear for precise predicates? Um, okay, so the question about precise predicates basically relates to um, when you are in two parallel threads and you're joining together and you want to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, and uh, semantically, what is needed there is precision. Um, 
And the way that this technique solves that is rather than, than requiring that our uh, predicates are precise, in particular, that's why I use list segment as my example, list segment not being precise. Um, we get precision using these nominal labels. So our technique is usable it for imprecise predicates, as long as you can essentially show that you had some consistent place at the beginning before you split it and then did a bunch of stuff. Okay, great. Thanks, Akunas. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, all right, let's much. move to the next, uh, next uh, talk. Approximate counting of minimal unsatisfiability subsets from by Haroslav Bendik from Masaryk University. Hi everyone, my name is Jaroslav Bendik, I'm from Masaryk University in Czech Republic and I would like to present a joint work with Kuli Pasmino from the National University of Singapore. We focus on counting of so-called minimal unsatisfiable subsets. So, what are the minimal unsatisfiable subsets? The input of our problem is a set of Boolean clauses, or equivalently a Boolean formula in CNF. So for example, assume that we are given these four Boolean clauses. This set of clauses is unsatisfiable because clearly the first two clauses contradict each other. If we are given an unsatisfiable Boolean formula, we usually want to somehow analyze the unsatisfiability. So how can we do that? Well, we can start by drawing the power set over the given set of clauses. So in this case, we get this picture. Now we can somehow determine which subsets are satisfiable and which are not, so we get this picture. And then we can see that there are two sources of the unsatisfiability. These two sources are called minimal unsatisfiable subsets. Formally, a set of clauses is a minimal unsatisfiable subset, shortly MUS, if it is unsatisfiable and every of its proper subsets are satisfiable. So that's for the definition of MUSIS. Due to the massive improvements of such solvers in the past two decades, Boolean formulas are widely used in almost all the areas of computer science. Consequently, there are also many applications of MUSIS. The goal is usually to either identify a single MUS, or possibly to identify the smallest MUS, or to enumerate all the MUSs, or to count the number of MUSs of a given formula. In our work, we focus on counting the number of MUSs. The motivation for the counting is usually to somehow evaluate the level of the unsatisfiability of the given Boolean formula. The current approach for counting the number of MUSs is to simply enumerate all the MUSs using the MUS enumeration algorithm. The problem is that there can be, in general, up to exponentially many MUSs with respect to the number of clauses, and therefore it is often practically intractable to enumerate all the MUSs. Our contribution is an approximate MUS counting algorithm called MUSIC. The input of MUSIC is a set of Boolean clauses together with a tolerance parameter epsilon and the confidence parameter delta. The output of a music is an estimate of the MUS count, that is, within the tolerance epsilon, with the confidence of at least 1 minus delta. Compared to the MUS enumeration based approaches, which need to enumerate up to exponentially many MUSes with respect to the number of clauses, a music needs to explicitly identify at most logarithmically many MUSes with respect to the number of clauses. Before we describe a music, let us first discuss a related counting problem, and that is the model counting problem. The input is the Boolean formula in CNF, and the goal is to count the number of models of f, that is, the number of satisfying assignments to the variables of f. So, for example, assume that we are given these three Boolean clauses, and we want to count the number of models. To do that, we have to consider all the possible valuations. The valuations can be represented using this power set. Each node of this power set represents a valuation of the variables. For example, the node at the very top represents the valuation where all the variables are set to true, and the node at the very bottom of the power set represents the valuation where all variables are set to false. If we somehow determine which valuations are models and which are not, we get this picture. There are four models. So what is the similarity to the most counting? Well, the input is also Boolean formula in CNF, but the main similarity is this power set structure. We are given a power set with two types of elements, and we want to count the number of one specific types of elements, either models or MUSES. We are specifically interested in a model counting algorithm called APROXMC. APROXMC is an approximate model counting algorithm. The input is a Boolean formula F, the tolerance epsilon, and a confidence delta. The output is an estimate of the model count that is within the tolerance epsilon with the confidence of at least 1 minus delta. 
Our most counting algorithm, mmusic, is based on the model counting algorithm approxmc. In particular, we keep the high-level idea of approxmc for exploring the balance structure and we propose new low-level techniques that are specific for the problem of most counting. Let us first describe the high-level idea that is the same for a music and approxmc. Assume that we are given a set of four boolean clauses which constitute this power set and let's say that there are three muses illustrated in the red color. As a first step, we divide the power set into several small cells. So let's say that we divide it into four cells, blue cell, pink cell, orange cell and white cell. Then we randomly choose one of these cells. So let's say that we choose the pink cell. Then we count the number of mooses in the cell. So in this case, there is one moose. And then we estimate the total moose count as the number of cells times the number of mooses in the single cell. So the estimate is four. To achieve the required confidence on this estimate, we repeat the whole process several times. So we repeatedly divide the power set into small cells, take one of these cells, count the number of mooses in one cell and estimate the full number of mooses. We store the individual estimates and then compute the final moose estimate as the median of the individual estimates. To ensure that we find an estimate which is within the required tolerance epsilon, it is important to choose an appropriate size of the cells. For example, assume that we choose a cell of size 1. In such a cell there can be either no or one moose. Therefore, there are only two possible estimates on the moose count. If we choose a cell of size 2, then there can be either no, one or two mooses. Therefore, there are only three possible estimates on the moose count. And so on. At the first glance, it might be useful to choose very large cells to be able to provide more precise estimates. However, on the other hand, the more mooses are in the cell, the harder it is to count them. Therefore, we need to balance the size of the cells. To find an appropriate cell, we first compute a numeric value called threshold, and then we find a cell that contains almost threshold mooses. The value of threshold is computed based on the required tolerance epsilon. So now let's see how we can find a cell that contains almost threshold mooses. The process consists of several steps. In the first step, we create several hash functions that divide the power set into cells. If we are given n clauses, then we create n hash functions. In our example, in this example, we are given four clauses, therefore we will create four hash functions. The first hash function, called h1, divides the power set into two cells, the white cell and the orange cell. The second hash function originates from the hash function h1 and it is created by splitting each cell of the h1 into two cells. So we will get four cells like this, blue cell, pink cell, white cell and orange cell. Another hash function h3 again originates from h2 by splitting the cells of h2 into two cells. So we get eight cells like this. And finally we create the hash function h4 which again originates from H3 by splitting the cells of H3 into two cells. So we get 16 cells. Now we choose from each of these four hash functions a single cell. First we choose at random a single cell from the hash function H4. So let's say that we choose the yellow cell like this. Then from the hash function H3 we choose a parent cell of the yellow cell. So in this case the parent cell is the pink cell because the pink cell was divided into two cells and one of them is the yellow cell. Similarly, we choose the parent cell of the pink cell in the hash function H2. So this is again the pink cell. And then we choose the parent cell of the pink cell in the hash function H1. So this is the orange cell. So we get these four cells. So we have obtained a sequence of cells with this parent relation, which means that the cells are totally ordered with respect to the set containment. Consequently, the mooses in these cells are also ordered with respect to the set containment. Therefore, we can find a cell in this order that contains almost threshold mooses and the next cell contains more than threshold mooses. And to find such a cell, we can use binary search. So we need to test only logarithmically many cells whether they contain more or less than threshold mooses. So let's see how we can check whether cell alpha contains less or more than threshold mooses. To do that, we identify one by one individual mooses in the cell. Eventually, we either find all mooses in the cell or we find threshold many mooses. We encode the problem of finding a single moose in the cell as a QBA formula and then we solve it 
with a QBF solver. On this slide, we will sketch the encoding. The basic query is the following. We have a cell alpha and a sub M of all renal muscles in the cell, and we ask whether there exists a subset S of F, such that S is in the cell alpha, S is not in the sub M of all renal muscles, and S is a mousse. The requirement that S is a mousse can be reformulated as S is unsatisfiable and every proper subset of S is satisfiable. Furthermore, the requirement that S is unsatisfiable can be reformulated as every evaluation of the variables of S satisfies the negation of S. Similarly, the fact that every proper subset of S is satisfiable can be reformulated as for every proper subset Q of S there exists a evaluation of the variables of Q that satisfies Q. So, here we have an exist for our exist QBF encoding, that is a free QBF encoding. To get the moose in the cell, we ask a free QBF solver for a witness of this formula. If there is no witness, then there are no more unexplored mooses in the cell. We won't go into technical details about the QBF encoding in this presentation. Instead, let us now see some additional properties of mooses that we exploit in the music. The first property is the monotonicity of the satisfiability function. In particular, it holds that if a set S of clauses is satisfiable, then every proper subset of S is also satisfiable. Therefore, when we identify such S, we can propagate the satisfiability of S through the power set, like this. Usually, if a set S is unsatisfiable, so for example this one, then we can propagate its unsatisfiability through the power set, like this. In a music, we identify some satisfiable and unsatisfiable subsets of F. We use information about the satisfiability of these sets to improve the most in cell QBF encoding. In particular, this information allows us to prune the search space of elements in the cell that we need to consider while looking for a moose. Another important property of mooses that we exploit concerns the union and the intersection of mooses of F. In particular, there are two simple observations. First, it holds that every moose of F contains the intersection of all mooses of F. Second, it holds that every moose of F is contained in the union of all mooses of F. Therefore, a prior knowledge of the intersection and the union can be used to significantly prune the search space where we need to look for mooses. Based on our practical experience, it is indeed the case that the union is relatively small with respect to the size of F, and the intersection is non-empty. In the paper, we have proposed two novel algorithms for computing the union and the intersection of mooses. We use the computed union and intersection to further simplify the moose in cell QBF encoding. So, that's all for the description of the music. Let's now move to the experimental evaluation. We have implemented the music in Python with the help of several external tools, such as some QBF solvers, QBF preprocessors, and some moose related tools. We have experimentally compared the music with two contemporary moose enumeration tools, Marco and Mutsusemus. These two tools either enumerate all mooses within a given time limit and thus provide the exact moose count, or they provide just an under approximation of the moose count with no approximation factor guarantees. As benchmarks, we used a collection of 1353 Boolean CNF formulas. Each of these formulas contains up to 400 clauses and up to 2 billion mooses. We run each tool on each benchmark with a time limit of 2 hours. The experimental evaluation has two parts. In the first part, we focus solely on the music and in particular on the accuracy of the music. Recall that the input of the music is the Boolean formula f together with a confidence parameter delta and the tolerance parameter epsilon. And the output is an estimate of the most count which is within the tolerance epsilon with a confidence of at least 1 minus delta. Also, we call that the algorithm during its computation performs several iterations, and in each iteration it computes a single Muscan estimate. After finishing all the iterations, the algorithm takes the median of these estimates and uses it as the final Muscan estimate. Basically, the more iterations are finished, the higher confidence can be achieved. In our case, we set the confidence to 0.2, which requires to finish 66 iterations. You can see two plots on this slide. The bottom plot shows for individual benchmarks on the x-axis the number of finished iterations. You can see that there are only 251 benchmarks where the algorithm finished all the iterations. 
On the top plot, you can see how accurate was the Muscan estimate provided by the algorithm for the corresponding benchmarks. In particular, we show the ratio between the estimate and the exact mus count. So, the closer is the ratio to 1, the more precise is the estimate. You can see that the estimates were usually very precise. Also, you can see that the more iterations were completed, the more precise were the estimates. Moreover, you can see that there is only one benchmark where the provided mus count wasn't within the required tolerance which is very good, because we have only an 8% confidence that the provided Muscan estimates will be within the tolerance. In the second part of the evolution, we focused on the scalability of the algorithms with respect to the number of muses in the given formula. In particular, here, on this plot, you can see on x-axis individual benchmarks, and on y-axis the Muscan estimate which was provided by individual algorithms. For the case of Marco and Metisemus, which are drawn in red and black respectively, the algorithms either completed the enumeration and thus provided the exact mus count, or they did not finish the computation and thus they provide just an under approximation of the mus count. You can see that these two algorithms were able to compute at most 1 million muses within the given time limit of 2 hours. On the other hand, a music was able to provide a mus count estimate even for benchmarks that contained 1 billion muses that is 1000 times more than the two Muse animation algorithms. So, let me sum up. We have presented an approximate Muse counting algorithm called a music. Compared to the existing Muse enumeration based algorithms, a music scales very well in the number of Muses in the given formula. Also, although there can be up to exponentially many Muses with respect to the number of clauses in the input formula, a music explicitly identifies only logarithmically many muses. Unfortunately, the implementation of a music scales relatively poorly in the number of clauses in the input formula. In our experimental evolution, we are able to deal with clauses that contain only a low hundred of clauses. There are several directions for our future work. First, we would like to design the dedicated QBF server for dealing with our muse in cell encoding. Second, we have seen that the Muscan estimates which are provided by a music are much more precise than the theoretical guarantees that we have. Therefore, we would like to improve on the theoretical guarantees of the algorithm. Finally, we would like to also focus on the problem of exact mus counting and on the problem of uniform mus sampling. So, that's it. Thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. Great. Thank you for your talk. Uh, and we have a question. Have you thought about applying it to the related problem of computing the number of prime implicants? Implicates. This question is from Armin Bier. Uh, no, uh, we haven't thought about this yet, but uh, it seems to be uh, an interesting uh, way of uh, future work. So thanks for this. OK. All right. Um, OK, uh, I have a question also. Uh, I noticed that uh, you have a time limit, and then you say how many uh, you know things completed in that time limit of I think seventy two hundred minutes uh, seconds or something. Like that. So my question was, do you have a, a handle on the time complexity? I mean, or something like that? Uh, I mean, did I, maybe I missed that in the talk. Uh, time complexity with respect to maybe number of clauses or something like that. I mean, what is it? Do we have a sense of that? Hmm. Well, uh, perhaps the most expensive part of the computation is solving the QBF encoding, and that's in three QBF. So the complexity is given basically by, by the size of the input formula, by the number of the clauses. And uh, the encoding into the three QBF is, uh, I believe, uh, polynomial. So, uh, and the complexity of the three QBF solver. Okay, great. Yeah, I see that there's another question from Odet Padon. I think uh, it, I think the question is already answered. Uh, I, I think we, we already addressed this question. Okay, great. All right, thanks, Aroslav, and uh, thank you for the nice work. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Let's, move on. let's move on to the next uh, talk. This talk is titled Nonlinear Craig Interpolant Generation and uh, presented by Naijun Zhan from Institute of Software, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Thanks. Hello, everyone. 
On behalf of my co-authors, I would like to present our work on nonlinear correct independent generation. Uh, this is the plan of my talk. Firstly, I would like to explain the motivation of this work. As we knew, correct interpolence is a very important solution in mathematical logic. In last decades, it has been widely used in the formal uh, verification community. In this community, uh, this solution has been abused with the reverse interpolence which is formally defined as here, given two formulas phi and c in a theory T such that phi and c is unsatisfiable. The formula I is called the correct interpolant of phi and c if phi implies I, I and c is unsatisfiable and I only contains common symbols and variables shared by Phi and Pussy. Here is an example. Consider two formulas A and B such that A and B is unsatisfiable. Once we project A and B onto the common variable x1 and x2, you can see the shapes of A and B in the right picture. What we need to do to find the, the interpolant with the boundary depicted as the red curve such that uh, A and B can be separated by it. Why interpolant synthesis is important? Uh, as we knew that a bootleg of existing verification technique like uh, the model checking, serum proving, and so on is a scannability. Fortunately, interpolation based technique can scale up existing verification techniques. In the neat area, it has been in connection with serum proving, model checking, SIGA, uh, learning based verification, and so on. Surely, correct interpolant synthesis plays a central role in interpolation-based technique, but most of existing works concerns decidable fragments of first-order logic, linear arithmetic, EUF, and so on, and their compilations. On the other hand, nonlinear constants are commonly used in the verification of programs and hybrid systems, but little work on it. Some first attempts in the literature include, uh, like Dai and others, proposed a new uh, approach based on positive staling sets and the SDP, but the, uh, the approach has a very strong limitation, means that uh, the two formulas should have the same set of variables. Later, Gan and others uh, pro propose approach based on uh, generalization of Morton's transposition theorem and SDP, but uh, their approach is uh, only applicable to concave quadratic polynomial equalities. Meantime, Gao and Tofri uh, propose another approach based on data decision procedure, which can be applied to formulas beyond non polynomials. But uh, their approach is applicable only the conjunction of two formulas is not data certifiable. Also, the generated interpolants can only be represented by a boolean combination of linear equalities and inequalities. Here we give a concrete example. Consider the two formula phi and C. Uh, once we project phi and C uh, onto the common variable x and y, as typically in the right picture, uh, how to compute interpolant to separate the two formula is a challenge for the existing uh, approach, including that approach, Gans approach, God's approach.
Fortunately, use, using our new approach, uh, such interpolant can be computed successfully. So the goal of this work is to investigate the new efficient and general approach to correctly interpolate the synthesis for learning arithmetic. The problem of interest uh, is formulated as follows. Given two formula, phi x phi and c x z, defined here, phi and c is unsatisfiable. What we need to do is find a polynomial h x in q x q x such that h x greater than zero is an interpolant for phi and c. The main contribution of this work uh, uh, consists of the following points. Firstly, we prove the existence of such h x. Secondly, we propose approach how to compute such HX based on SDP. Then we discuss how to avoid unsoundness caused by numeric ISO in SDP, either by verified SDP serving or postulatory symbolic verification. Lastly, we discuss how to apply this result to invariant generation in program verification. Now we touch the technical details. Uh, to that, uh, we need some the definition, definitions. Uh, given a set of polynomials is called the quadratic modular. If it contains one and is closed and addition and multiplication with squares. Given a set of polynomials P1 and PS, the quadratic modular generated by P1 to PS is returned as here. Uh, let M be a quadratic modular over the X1 to Xn. M is said to be admitting if, it, uh, if there is uh, some positive variable uh, uh, number A such that A minus summation Xi in the M which means that each variable is bounded with a lower bound and upper bound. So a semi-algebra set defined here is a set of admitting form if the uh, quadratic module generated from the, the, uh, its polynomials is admitting. So now we see how to prove the existence of interpolant. First step, based on putting a, putting a positive statement sets, we prove that given two closed basic semi-algebra sets, S1 and S2, if S1 and S2 is disjoint, then we can prove there is a polynomial H1x such that H1x is positive over S1 and negative over S2. Then we can further generalize lemma 1 to lemma 2. Here we assume that there are uh, B plus 1 um, close semi-algebra sets, S1 to Sb, such that S1 is disjoint with the union of S1 to Sb. Then we can find a polynomial H1x such that H is positive over S0 and negative over the union of S1 to Sb. The lemma 3 is a direct result of Sittenberg, a task and Sittenberg result, which means that once we project the, the, the set defined by phi x1 onto the x, the result set is a compact semi-algebra set, which is a finite unit of basic closed semi-algebra sets. The same claim applies to the set per x plus x z. The lemma 4 claims that 
if Hx satisfies the following condition, means that uh, Hx is positive over the, uh, the projection of Xy onto the X, and the negative on the projection of pussy xz onto x, then hx greater than zero is an independent for phi xy and pussy xz. So based on the above lemmas, we can prove the uh, existence of interpolants as indicated in the theorem one. Now also we can. Uh, Divide the uh, theorem one to theorem two by uh, restrict the coefficients of the uh, the hx to uh, rational numbers. Now we consider how to compute hx. Actually, you see that uh, we can um, the formula to compute HX to a semi-definite uh, program problem uh, according to the theorem 3 and get a, a result the SDP as indicated by the equation Y here. Further, we can prove our approach is a sound and a relative component. Definitely because our approach is based on um, numeric uh, computation, particularly based on SDP, certainly uh, it could be uh, it could be possible that uh, unsound because of the numeric iso, which means that since the interpolant could be not zero interpolant, so we have to uh, guarantee the uh, soundness of approach. Here we pro propose the two approach. Firstly, we apply the ISO analysis method adapted from the work of Zox and others in 2016. Uh, it's called a verified SDP survey. It claims that if the numeric tolerance is small enough and the length of the floating point representation is long enough, any numeric result HX greater than zero written by calling an SDP server to equation 1 is currently to be a zero independent for phi and per C. That is the, a correct solution to problem 1. Certainly, we can also verify the uh, synthesis interpolant by simply uh, computation checking. For example, uh, we can apply some uh, symbolic sim computation tool like uh, Zredlock. We can further generalize the approach to more general problem, uh, uh, like the problem 2. Then we can um, get the corresponding SDP problem uh, formulated as the equation 2. Here we consider a very challenging um, a benchmark for independent generation given in one key uh, 2019 paper, Phi and Pussy. Uh, Picturely, you see that uh, the, the, the formula can be depicted uh, as the left picture. Uh, fortunately, here we can use an approach to successfully generate independent for these two formulas uh, as depicted here. Now I will talk about uh, how to apply approach to program verification, particularly to environment generation. Traditionally, uh, environment generation can be done by forward reachability analysis together with the uh, strongest uh, post-condition computation like the Fung 1A, or by backward reachability analysis together with uh, uh, which is the precondition computation like uh, the Fung 1B here. In 2017, Ning and uh, his co-authors proposed a new approach uh, to combine the two miners together with the interpolation technique. Uh, the basic idea like the Fung 2, uh, at the very beginning, we compute the uh, strongest post-condition of the uh, precondition. 
Uh, meanwhile, we compute the uh, weakest precondition of the ligation of post condition. Then we get the interpolance of the, the two formulas. We can get the form uh, the interpolancy i. Then we check whether i is an interpolant of the program. If it is, we have done. Uh, otherwise, we repeat this procedure. We compute the strongest post condition of the uh, of the formula uh, computed in the in the last step uh, together with the interpolant. Uh, meanwhile, we well we also compute the weakest precondition uh, of the formula. Uh, 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 I mean that uh, the weakest precondition computed in the last step uh, together to get the new interpolants and repeat this procedure uh, until we find an invariant. In this framework, uh, interpolation, uh, technique, uh, in interpolation component is mainly for uh, first order logic and linear arithmetic. Here we consider to replace the interpolation component with uh, our approach so that uh, we can extend the, uh, his uh, their framework to nonlinear invariant generation. The concrete uh, algorithm is given in algorithm one. I will skip the technical details. If you are interested in uh, this work, you can have a look at our paper. Now I will go back to the concluding part. Uh, in this paper, we propose a sound and a relative complete method to synthesize cryic interpolants for mutually con contradictory polynomial formulas. We discuss how to avoid the unsoundness caused by numeric either in SDP, either by verified SDP serving or posterior symbolic verification. We demonstrate its application to invariant generation in program verification. Regarding future work, we mention the first one about uh, how to drop the arithmetic condition. The second one, it is an interesting and a challenging problem to consider uh, independent synthesis for formulas with uh, strict polynomial equality. The last one is that it deserves to consider how to synthesis interpolants for the compilation of nonlinear formulas and other theories based on our approach and other existing ones. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you for the talk. And um, while we're waiting for the questions, I guess I have one question. Um, Right. So, uh, so, so you talked about the application of this Craig uh, nonlinear Craig interpolant generation to invariant inference. I was wondering. Um, I mean, did you try it on some uh, real world programs or something like that? I mean, what kind of benchmarks does one use to evaluate uh, the, the 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 efficiency of such a thing and the value of such yeah, of your work? Uh, my name is Ben uh, Najwin Lats. So I will. Uh, answer the question, but uh, maybe this is uh, because now we try. Uh, we just uh, we just um, our methods can just um, deal with polynomial, right? Polynomial equalities and something like this. Maybe we for the real few, um, uh, real applications. Uh, now we, we didn't uh, apply it to, but maybe it's a future work. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, are there more questions? All right, okay, so so let's thank the speakers. Thank you for, for the nice talk and the nice okay, work. Thanks. Yeah, my video really doesn't work, so thanks, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Uh, so the next talk in the session, the last talk of the session is recursive data structures <laughs> in Spark. Um, this is by Claire Dross from Ada Code. Hello, everybody. My name is Claire Dross. I work at EdaCore, a company providing tools for the Ada language. In my team, we develop a tool for formal verification of a subset of Ada named Spark. I will present now the recent developments done in this tool to support the verification of imperative algorithms on recursive data structures. 
Aida is a general purpose language. It was designed for safety. In particular, it features a strong type system which allows users to declare their own type, possibly with additional constraints. For example, the type MOLINT ranges from minus 100 to 100. These types are associated with checks. For example, if I declare a value of the type MOLINT, I will need to make sure that the value I give is in the range of the type. These checks can be done statically if everything is statically known, like here, what usually they are done at runtime. In my team, we develop a tool to statically verify all these checks, which are usually done at runtime. It works on a subset of IDA, which was designed for formal verification, which is named Spark. The tool performs deductive verification in takes some Spark code annotated with contracts and generates logical formula from it, which are then added to automatic SMT solvers. The Spark subset has been designed to facilitate automatic verification. It restricts the language, in particular, it disallows aliases. Indeed, aliases complicate the verification. For example, here I have a pointer x which designates a value t, and I have an alias y of this pointer. If I update the designated values for y, I need some kind of alias analysis to know that it has also modified x. Because we have prevented aliases, pointers have been out of the Spark subset for a long time. Recently, we have added support from them by adding an ownership policy inspired by REST. The idea is that each, uh, each designated value has a single owner, which is allowed to both access and modify it. This is ensured by moving ownership on assignment. So for example here, when I assign x into y, the ownership of x is transferred to y. It means that I am allowed to modify the designated value for y in the next line, but I will not be allowed to read it through x. This allows the verification tool to simply ignore aliases for the verification, and this is what we do in Spark. Now that we have pointers in Spark, you would like to verify algorithms over recursive data structures. Since IDA is an imperative language, these algorithms usually involve a loop. For example, set all to zero traverses a list and sets all its values to zero. This program is not valid Spark. Indeed, when I create the object y, I move the ownership of x into y. Then, inside the loop, I am, I am allowed to modify the data structure through y, but when I do y is y.next, I will lose the ownership of the first cell of y. Indeed, it is not accessible through y anymore, and it cannot be accessed through x either, since it does not have the ownership. So at the end of the, of the loop, I, when I want to restore the ownership to x, I cannot do it. What I would need here is a way to only transfer the ownership for a uh, given amount of, of time for the duration of the loop. This mechanism exists in Rust, it is called borrowing. Sparks allow to borrow the ownership of an object temporarily by creating an, an object of an anonymous access type. So here, in fact, we don't use the type list for Y, we use the type access list cell, which is an anonymous pointer type. This means that Y is a borrow. Then, in the body, of the, pro of the procedure, we are allowed to modify the data structure through y, since it has the ownership. The next uh, statement, which say, which say y is y.next, is not really a, modif a modification of the underlying data structure, it is what we call a reborrow. It modifies the borrower so that it designates something deeper in the data structure. Then at the end of, loop, of the loop, the ownership automatically returns to x. So this is exactly what we want for this procedure. But we can see that in fact here, y is an alias of x. It allows to modify it at an, ab an arbitrarily deep position, which is not known statically because of repose. So how do we handle that in Spark, since we don't have any memory model? A local borrower in Spark is considered to be the two different objects. First, there is an object which is a data structure, which is designated by Y, like any other pointer type. And then there is a predicate, which is called the borrow relation, which relates the value of the borrowed object to the value of the borrower. It is used to reconstruct the object at the end of the borrow. So for example, here, when I, I see the value Y, I will create two objects. The data structure, which is a copy of the data structure stored in Y, and also a predicate, which says that X and Y really designate the same structure. When I, I enter the first iteration of the loop, I will modify Y dot data. This modify just the standalone structure for Y. And then when I do Y is Y dot next, the reborrow, I will need to also modify the borrow relation. 
Indeed, after this statement, why doesn't this net the same value as x in this net itself? We also know that the first value of x is zero. We know that because this value has been frozen in the borrow. We are not allowed to modify it anymore. Indeed, it is not accessible through y anymore, and x doesn't have the ownership. So it has the value that it had at the time of the real borrow, which is zero. With the same reasoning, we know that at the end of the loop, x is made of as many zeros as there have been loop iteration, followed by y. Since we know that y is null, we can reconstruct x. So this program cannot be proved as is by the analysis tool. Indeed, in Spark, we perform deducted verification, so we would need a loop invariant. Here, the invariant should both describe the, the data structure designated by y and the Borel relation since it is modified in the loop. If you are interested, read our artic article. If you want to try our tool, it is available online. Don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks for your attention. Hello, everybody. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks, Claire, for that uh, for the talk. And uh, all right, so we are waiting for questions here. I have a question. Um, all right, so so I, I enjoyed this uh, this description of how aliases are not allowed in Spark, and uh, but yet there is something called borrow. So is uh, is borrow uh, kind of a restricted type system? I mean, you can't do it everywhere in the program. You can only do it at function arguments or something like that? Is that the idea? Um, not really. You can uh, do it uh, everywhere you want, since you can okay. declare a local borrower, as you have seen, uh, inside the, the body of the, of the sub-program. But there are some restrictions. In particular, you have to statically know which structure is borrowed at the time of the borrow, even if you can uh, then uh, modify the, the borrow so that it designates something deeper and you don't know statically what it is anymore. But you still know which data structure at least is borrowed. Okay. Okay. Great. Also, I, I noticed there's a, there's a, some similarity between the Spark programming model and the Rust programming language. Maybe is that is that right? I mean, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, uh, Spark was uh, Rust was designed uh, for uh, safety of uh, programs, and it's the same for IDA. Uh, in Spark, we are really interested we interested in uh, formal verification of, uh, of ADA. So we handle things a bit differently than they are handled in, uh, in ADA in general. Uh, in particular, uh, ADA, um, for, uh, for pointers, ADA has some, some mechanism to ensure some kind of safety uh, to avoid dangling pointers in some cases, but it is not uh, very powerful, not, not like Rust. So when we wanted to, to add pointers in, in Spark, we wanted something stronger, of course. So that's why we went to, to go at what was done in Rust. So it is a bit similar, but even if it is a bit more constrained in, uh, in ADA, since we are in, uh, sorry, in Spark, since we are uh, going for formal verification, and that's not what they are doing uh, in Rust, so a bit more constrained. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you again for, for the nice talk and the nice work. Uh, great. Thank you. And with that, uh, we are at the end of this session. Uh, I would like to remind all our uh, participants that there's a breakout session right after the session. So please make the best use of it. Uh, okay, thank you for being a part of the session. Bye bye. And also, I want to thank Chungha, who is a student volunteer in the session. Thanks, Chungha. Thank you very much.